We thought we'd use this opportunity to talk about what the engineer's influence was on the design of long span structures. And our approach to that was, first of all, very briefly to look at that kind of historical context about where structural engineers and the role that we had taken. Then to talk about three projects and the three drive, three different drivers for each of those projects. And then finally, Hugh is going to talk a little bit about how we think, Giancarlo, Hugh and myself, those drivers might change as time moves forward. It's largely understood that the kind of um, the blazing lights of the long span structural team, the lights of Eiffel and Nervi and Shukov, uh, were not only the structural designers of their projects, they played a major role in the architectural design and were heavily involved throughout the construction. And you compare that role to where we are today, where we're heavily specialized. And even in the UK, we won't typically take responsibility for connection detailing or for rebar detailing. So it has changed considerably from where these great masters started. In that seminal book by David Billington, The Tower and the Bridge, he looked at those early masters and kind of arrived at three significant drivers two fundamentally external ones around efficiency and economy, which was fundamental to their particular design being selected and realized. And then one slightly more subconscious one around elegance, um, making subconscious decisions around the sizing, proportioning of the structure to ensure that it worked within that context. And these are the drivers that we're gonna re revisit in the context of these projects that we have designed over the last 10 years. There's many examples um, going through the mid 20th century where those drivers have um, clearly been represented and not, uh, you know, the Schleich and Fry Ocho project is an incredible demonstration of that. But possibly we, it's, we lost our way a little bit as an industry and moved from those kind of core engineering drivers to being more about the facilitators of incredible architectural forms. And this was kind of happening in the late 20th, early 21st century. And we wonder, and Hugh will elaborate on whether this refocus on material efficiency as a consequence of climate change might redirect us back towards some of those early drivers around efficiency in the economy. But we've got to remember that those projects were in a very different context, both in terms of cost, but particularly in terms of embodied carbon. Historically, embodied carbon has been a small proportion of the total carbon implications of a project. And that has already changed significantly in recent history to where now it represents 40% of a total typical office building. And it's only ever going to increase in its importance as the um, decarbonation of the electrical grid continues at its incredible rate. And that is particularly true of Stadia because they, despite opportunities to try and use them as conference facilities and um, uh, music concerts, etc., they still are fundamentally only used for a very short period of time. And they're massive investments in terms of money, but also in terms of carbon. So the proportions associated with embodied carbon versus operational carbon are heavily skewed in these projects. So we want to revisit those three um, drivers that David Billington identified around efficiency, economy, and elegance. And I want to talk about efficiency in the context of Singapore Sports Hub, or more accurately, the National Stadium of Singapore, where I was the lead engineer for the roof and addressed and had to deal with many of the issues that have been raised already at this conference. The National Stadium of Singapore houses 60,000 seats, has a concrete, conventional concrete um, bowl and a long span roof that clear spans the bowl structure and at 310 meters is currently to the best of our knowledge at least the longest span dome in the world. It was architecturally designed by Arup as well as engineered and delivered by Buig or in fact their local partner Dragage. It consists of two movable roof leaves um, for the reasons already described that need to open out to be able to provide sunlight down onto the pitch and allow the pitch to grow but also protect the spectators and players um, in events or for mu music concerts. Getting the design of that movable roof 
as light as humanly possible was the first step to drive efficiency into this project. So we used ETFE pillows to drive down their weight. We optimized the size of the steel um, trusses onto which they're supported and reduce the weight of all of the driving systems by locating the driving mechanisms within the roof themselves. Next slide. The next step in terms of looking at the efficiency of the fixed roof was to get the, the structural diagram of that roof right. And here we arrived at the final scheme, which has these um, transverse trusses that uh, span across the bridge, across the pitch, sorry. Um, the, those are the runway trusses, sorry, transverse trusses that span in the other direction, orthogonal direction to give the whole thing a degree of two-way spanning capability, and diagonal trusses that turn it all into a, a dome structure and mobilize and take the benefits of the form. All of that sits on a kilometer long, six meter wide post-tensioned ring beam to resolve all of the thrust forces at the concourse level. The next step around efficiency was attacking the most significant wind uh, loads on the roof, which are the wind loads, once you'd accounted, reduce the weight of the movable roof. And we did that by throwing away all the peak pressures and instead interrogating the wind tunnel results so that we could arrive at the set of coincident wind loads, which are the worst possible pattern for the roof. We used the degree of engineering judgment to determine what those patterns might be, but also looked at the mode shapes, the buckling mode shapes, and applied unit strains onto key elements to determine what that pattern of wind loading um, might ultimately be in terms of the worst possible loading on the roof. That process resulted in a major reduction in the wind loads. The next most significant set of loads was the self weight of the roof itself. And here we introduced optimization routines to iteratively remove elements out uh, material out of the roof and in each step we were then reducing the loads which allowed us to enter this really fantastic um, iterative uh, system of refining the roof tonnage and all three of those things combined really led to us being able to deliver this roof for about 40 percent of the steel that ordinarily you would expect for a building of this span Thanks, Will. Um, I am going to speak about the Lord's Warner stand um, and the role of elegance. Um, so um, onto a very uh, different scale and an entirely different context, this is the Lord's Warner stand designed in collaboration with Populist Architects. Um, it's part of Lord's Cricket Ground and seats around 2,700 spectators. Um, uh, the fabric and timber roof that you can see on screen now uh, within such a sensitive context needs to be driven by an entirely different set of uh, considerations to the previous project. And um, so something about the context, um, it includes several uh, pieces of prominent architecture, which are very much um, of their time, um, including a, a kind of grade two star listed building adjacent to the stand. The stand itself is indicated in red. Um, the media center, a, a kind of very iconic piece of architecture, the grandstand and the mount stand renovation. Uh, and so it was really important that the Warner stand was also of its time and hence to use specific uh, materials um, such as timber. So onto the um, the, the, the solution that was opted for, this was a, a fabric roof stretched over a steel framework um, used to derive the required curvature in the fabric so that it could re resist loads. Um, and all of this is supported on a, on a radial grid of timber glue lamb beams made of American hardwood. Um, the overall effect is, is one of lightness. And the scheme itself, um, kind of the imagery is quite reminiscent of Leonardo's flying devices that you can see sketched in the, in the lower left corner, or even the, the wing of a bat. Um, so, some requirements for the um, for the amazing uh, kind of internal space that the that the roof kind of sat right above. So architecturally, it, it needed to feel um, right like it was outside. Um, the fabric needed to admit light so that so that this feeling would uh, kind of would be reinforced. Um, but it also had to satisfy thermal and acoustic require requirements of the restaurant, the hospitality space. So to achieve these requirements, an innovative product, TensorTherm, was identified, and this consists of two skins, 
uh, a PTFE structural skin on the outside and a separate membrane on the inside. And with, between these two, there's an internal translucent, translucent aerogel, um, which gives it its insulating properties. So the, the product required testing to guarantee that it could satisfy um, the requirements and also British standards. So onto the, the glue lamb elements. So th these are up to 25 meters in overall length um, with maximum cantilevers of around 15 meters. Um, in timber, there is an obvious tendency for element dimensions to get larger due to reduced material strength. However, there was understandable pressure given the context from planners and architects to slim the sections down as far as possible. Um, again, the theme of, uh, of lightness and elegance. Um, that meant using higher grade materials um, such, such as American white oak and maximizing uh, the use of the sections, of course. And um, so the American hardwood to kind of uh, um, satisfy all requirements re um, required full scale uh, testing. And this firstly co confirmed our assumptions about the finger joints. Um, typically the finger joints um, are stronger than the laminates, but this wasn't the case uh, in, in, our, in our elements because of the higher grade material. And so um, the finger joints prevented the full mobilization of strength. It was a reduction of around 30%. Um, the testing also revealed other problems like glue absorption um, into, because this is a, a very high strength timber, uh, different properties, it's, it's uh, got elevated densities. And so a fair amount of the testing was also looked at different glues and the treatment of the surfaces uh, um, to avoid uh, issues of, of potential delamination. Finally, the testing um, was also necessary to obtain CE's uh, certification of the beams uh, for, for this specific material. And here is the, the finished product with its um, kind of pretty distinct uh, architecture. Um, and we think a very readable theme of elegance. Um, it's, it's worth noting that the, uh, the outcome, the structure is still a, a lightweight, is still lightweight and efficient in of itself. Thank you, Giancarlo. I'm going to talk about Brentford Community Stadium and economy as the key driver for innovation on this project. Brentford Community Stadium opened last year and realises the club's long-term ambition for a premiership-ready stadium. There had been numerous previous schemes going back to the early 2000s, but none had proved financially viable. So this is really a story of economic engineering um, making the project viable. And of course, structural engineering, economic structural engineering was a guiding principle for this project. Unlike a typical building where structure may be associated with around a quarter of the overall stadium of the overall building costs, in stadia, the structure can often be attributed to around 40% of the costs. And of course, it also influences the other key cost factors, including the facade, the cladding, and the bowl. So our approach, um, the first step in our approach was to identify the cost hotspots and to develop rationalized structural forms to mitigate these. This included eliminating cantilevers and transverse, transfer structures and fabricated components, as well as optimizing the depth of structural elements within the constraints of planning and operational requirements. Part of this rationalization were the 27 meter long hockey stick trusses on the east and west stands, which follow the balancing principle of a wine bottle holder, where the center of load is within the supporting the support zone. This allowed us to mitigate the tension forces at the back of the stand, um, eliminating tension piles and really paring down the structure to its most rational form. As the backspan of the hockey sticks trusses are expressed externally, and we designed the columns as cantilever elements to mitigate the need for a vertical brace. As you can see here, this enabled a very uh, legible and clear structural diagram to be expressed in the structure. But the rationalization wasn't at the expense of performance, and we looked to enhance this uh, as far as we could. Um, one example is the transverse spanning spreader truss, which enhances robustness and system performance under localized wind pressures. It's a neat solution that also reduced the number of lifts associated with the construction because the spreader truss was uh, lifted in prefabricated sections. But of course, 
building economically also meant building efficiently. And here we collaborated with the steelwork contractor, JD Pierce and Buckingham Group to incorporate as many of the construction requirements into the permanent works as possible. Here you can see the permanent work stability bay being positioned to enable a self-stable first lift of the roof cantilevers. So following the rationalization process and the integration of construction requirements, we carried out computational optimization to further reduce the tonnage of the structure. And the, the results was, um, was reducing the structural costs in the, in the project by over 30% for only a 10% reduction in capacity compared with the previous scheme. So we have talked about three projects that were designed over the last five to 10 years, but we wanted to now return to today's drivers. And a number of studies have shown the step change that is required in our industry to avert climate breakdown. And for us as long span and stadia designers, this is a very stark and urgent challenge. We think the carbon emissions uh, reduction hierarchy that's discussed in past 2080 is a good framework for approaching long span designs. And uh, the good news here is that many of these uh, approaches we are very familiar with. We've talked about optimization and material innovation. However, these tend to be towards the bottom of the hierarchy. And we believe that as structural engineers and construction professionals, we have a responsibility to work towards the the top end of this hierarchy. So we wanted to end this presentation on a recent example of uh, that talks to this theme of the, uh, the top end of the hierarchy. This is the Ken Rosewell Arena, originally constructed for Sydney 2000 Olympics. It was recently redeveloped with a extremely lightweight fabric tensile roof without the need for additional foundations or uh, modifications to the bowl. We think this demonstrates that elegant structural engineering is still very much at the center of sustainable solutions that minimize whole life carbon emissions. Thank you very much.